Okay, hello, welcome. Um, my name is Anna Cash. I'm a master food preserver and um, I love talking about canning. So this is like right up my alley. Um, today we're gonna be specifically talking about pressure canning. Uh, just by raise of hands, how many of you have pressure canned anything before? Okay. What have you guys pressure canned? Chicken. Chicken. Soup. Perfect. Corn. Great. Beans. Corn yes. Yeah. Vegetables. Perfect. Okay, so pressure canning um, is one of my favorite <coughs> things to do. It's also one of the things, hello, welcome. Um, it's one of the things that people are most scared about. Whenever I have canning classes, people are like, I do water bath canning, but pressure canning sounds too scary. I've heard horror stories, like my mom's top blue in the kitchen, and there was a, you know what I mean? Like, very scary stories. Um, but I find that once you know how to do water bath canning with high acid food and pressure canning with low acid foods, you can do anything, yeah. Um, okay, so first off, we are going to show a quick YouTube video. It's about 11 minutes, and it's kind of, go ahead, come on in, hello. Hey, hello. Um, it's just talking about kind of the mistakes you can make in pressure canning and why it's important to follow all of the rules and specifications in your canning recipe. So we'll go ahead and do that. That's when we watched that in our Master Food Preservers um, certification course, I was like horrified because I had not used a pressure canner up to that point and I was like, now there's no chance of using one. I was so scared. But she does cover some really important aspects um, to pressure canning that, that you absolutely need to do. And as long as you follow the instructions with your manual or in your um, ball canning book, you're gonna be fine. Like, I'm not showing you that video to scare you to never do it. It's just to do it properly. Um, okay, so we did this earlier, but raise your hand if you've pressure canned anything before. There's some new people. Have you guys done pressure canning before? No? Okay, you're scared, but you're gonna do it. It's gonna be great. Um, okay. Pressure canning is canning foods um, at a temperature above boiling water. So when you water bath can, you, you're gonna be boiling at 220. The pressure canner allows you to do a temperature of about 240. So it's super important that you have that higher temperature to kill that botulism toxin and also to create that anaerobic environment to make it shelf stable, basically. Okay, so there are high acid foods and there are low acid foods. Can you guys think of some high acid foods that you would water bath? Peaches, tomatoes. Peaches, tomatoes. Anything else? Jams, jellies. Applesauce. Applesauce, pickles. Anything basically with a pH of 4.7 or higher is going to be water bath canned. Um, and the lower acid foods, I've got some here of ones that I've done. I can pass these around. This is um, salmon. I grew up in Alaska and uh, my family sent me salmon. It's the best ever. So I pressure canned that. This is some white beans that I've done. I'll, I'll pass these around. This meat is not appetizing looking, but it does taste very good. Uh, and then I also have a quart <coughs> jar of uh, soup that I made, which is just potatoes, carrots, celery, and onion with a chicken stock. So this is the base of my soup that I use. It basically is like a meal in a jar. You can add other things. Sometimes I'll add like chicken or noodles to this after I've canned it. Or yes, after I've canned it and put it in my pot. Pass that around. Okay. Go ahead. Like I said. Yeah, sure. What's the difference between water bath and the pressure cooker? Temperature. So the water bath would be like that, but without the pressure type lid? Yep. Toilet? Yep. Okay, that's what. Yeah, so your pressure canner, when you, when you only add that little bit of water and you turn that lid on and you heat it up, then you exhaust it for about 10 minutes. We'll talk about this later, but uh, then when you cap it with this, uh, weighted gauge, 
that allows the pressure to build up in your steam pressure canner and get to a higher temperature. Does that release the pressure also once it gets to a certain point? Um, no, that's a good question. We'll cover that. Okay. You're like jumping ahead. You're super <laughs> on top of it. Okay. Um, and at our altitude, this is super important. At our altitude, we are going to want a pressure can at 15 pounds pressure. Uh, if you have, well, I guess in the All American, which hopefully will be here in October, they have a weighted gauge that has 5, 10, or 15 pounds on the weighted gauge. This is a dial gauge uh, pressure, sorry, not cooker, canner. This is a pressure canner and you will look at the dial gauge to get the correct pounds pressure, okay? So uh, I believe here in Ogden, it's around 13 pounds pressure, 13 and a half, something like that. But you'll wanna bring that in, get it tested by um, the extension office. They were just here on Saturday uh, doing an in-store thing. Teresa came and did that. But you can also call the extension office if you missed that window to get it tested and schedule to get your dial gauge tested. Okay. All right, so why pressure canning? Well, the number one reason is to um, kill the botulism toxin that can be in low acid foods. Uh, botulism bacteria can't live in high acid foods. Um, but botulism toxin is so interesting. It's just such an interesting bacteria because it grows in an anaerobic environment. So where there's no air coming in and out, there's no airflow, that's where it thrives. Um, the other ones, the other foodborne illnesses or bacteria are gonna be like mold, uh, salmonella, things like that. That's gonna be in like jars that are open. But botulism, botulism is the number one for low acid foods. Right. Um, this is basically talking about that it needs to be a low acid food, anaerobic environment, the temperature needs to be in that gauge, and also it needs to be relatively high moisture, which most of your canned products will have moisture in it. So it's important that you take all of the precautions. Um, like I said before, when you're doing pressure canning, you have to have it, the dial gauge, at the specific pounds pressure for your altitude. So if you're at sea level, um, I grew up at sea level in Alaska and my mom used 11 pounds pressure. We are here in Ogden. I live by the mouth of the canyon. I'm at about 4,200 feet in the elevation. So I'm always at 13 PSI. Um, do you get, where do you guys live often? or Layton. Layton, yeah. You can always check online. You can Google that information. You can put in your address and elevation, city elevation. Um, yeah, this, this information is also available online. It's also in your, this book is available here at Smith & Edwards. I love this book, the Ball Blue Book Guide to Preserving. All right. Um, like we said, there was a, an event last Saturday testing your dial gauge. It's important if you're using your pressure canner a lot during the summer that you get it tested yearly, but if you're just using it once or twice, maybe every other year. <laughs> this is why people are scared of pressure canning. Can you guys see that picture? That lid is literally up in the ceiling. Um, but there are some safety measures that Presto and All American have made and put into these newer models that weren't available in the older models. Specifically, let me show you. There's this little black safety here, and this is rubber, and this will blow. This will release that pressure if you get above where it needs to be, like usually, yeah, over 20 uh, PSI. You guys have that? Maybe? Go home and look, and if you're, um, yeah, just just buy one with one of these. It gives you a better, better feeling in your heart. <laughs> okay. All right, let's talk about the parts of a canner. I'm going to pass around. Is that okay, Vicki, if we pass this around? And you guys can just take a look at it, and be careful that weighted gauge comes 
Okay. Like I said before, this is the dial gauge. This is the weighted gauge. This is the vent port. This is your safety. And then here on, uh, on these Prestos, it also has this that will pop up when your uh, lid is sealed. Uh, on the All-American, I don't believe the All-American has this function. No, they just have the rubber and the... Yeah. The yeah. Um, that is the difference. I have both pressure canners, and at certain times I like using one or the other. Uh, and then, sorry, there are arrows here on the top lid, you can see. There's an arrow here, and then also an arrow on this. You align them. And then you twist. Yes? The lid does have the rubber on it now, the rubber button on the All-American lid. Yeah. Yeah, it does, but it doesn't have this, right? This that pops up. I don't believe it's on mine. Okay. Any questions about the parts of the lid? Yes. Is there one brand you would prefer over another? Um, well, there are some things to take into consideration when you're buying a pressure canner. Uh, this Presto pressure canner um, is not as heavy as an All-American. So if you have say like seven quarts full of soup plus this in an all-american it's going to be pretty heavy so if that's a consideration for you just think about that the presto is very light um it's less expensive but you also have more temperature fluctuations because the metal is thinner so on my all-american it's almost like a cast iron skillet right like once it gets hot it stays hot for a long time in the All-American, the temperature stays pretty consistent. For me, I have a harder time keeping temperature consistent with the Presto, but I love that it's light and it heats up fast and it also cools down fast. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, on, the, on the lids of those, the yeah. rubber O-ring inside, Yeah. can you get replacements for those? Yes. Yep, yeah. and they are available here at Smith & Edwards. Here's the ring. Okay. And then there's also replacement parts for your dial gauge and your pressure regulator. Uh, for those of you that are passing this around, this is a really important part that seals the lid to your pressure canner. And over time, sometimes these can crack. So what I do is I put a little bit of vegetable oil on it every couple times that I use the pressure canner, uh, just so it doesn't crack. Or, if it cracks, just get a new one. Don't use a, a bad seal. Yeah. Great questions. They also come with one rack in the bottom. Smith and Edwards also sells extra racks so that you can do double in your pressure canner. You can do two, stack it too high. Okay. Any questions about that? There's also, um, like we said, uh, an instruction manual as well. Is it yeah. better to use two or does it matter? Um, for me, if I'm doing uh, a ton of green beans like she was and I'm doing them in pint jars, I can, do, I can stack them too high in here. Oh, so I it one. cuts the time in half of how, how many batches. So it'll be one have. on top of the other? Uh, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. But you'll want to rack in there um, separating the two. Great question. And that rack sits right on top of the jars? Yeah. Vicki? Uh, one question we get, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, that we'll get as uh, on a ceiling ring, if you're going in to get a ceiling ring or your canner, it does have to be the same brand and it does have to be the correct number that is either stamped on that or in your book. I've had a customer that we didn't have one they needed, they're like, and the, the older one that's thinner, it fits bigger, so you have to kind of work it back in itself. Okay. They wanted to just cut it so it would fit and then put it in. So don't do it's that. It's amazing <laughs> the questions you'll get, but just I'm know sure. when you replace your ceiling ring, it 
does have to be exact. So they're not all the same Perfect. size? No. 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 They're all different. There's different thicknesses. Uh, Marrow makes a different one than Presto, and mm -hmm. they don't interchange them. Just make sure and hold out for the right yeah. one. Yeah. And another thing to take into consideration is that the Presto uh, and Miro have ceiling rings, but the All-American does not. It's just metal on metal, and yeah, there's. it almost looks like you're detonating a bomb. You are not. It's great. It gives you peace of mind, because there's like these really great, I don't know what they're called. Threaded knobs. Yeah, thank you, threaded knobs. Uh, okay. We already talked about the replacement parts. They're available here. If they aren't available in store, I'm sure you can order them online as well. All right, pressure canning basics. This is um, shown here. This is just a weighted gauge pressure canner without the dial, um, but you are going to fill your jars. One thing that's different about pressure canning versus water bath canning is that you don't have to have hot jars, hot product going into your pressure canner. Like I've done green beans with just water, salt. Um, and then you are going to add two to three inches of hot water in the bottom of your pressure canner. And that's before you add your jars. Okay. Then you put your jars in and you're going to exhaust all the air from um, the pressure canner for 10 minutes. You have to do this step to get up to that temperature that you need. Repeat after me. I will vent for 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, and then once you're, you're done uh, venting, then you add your weighted gauge on the top. Yeah, Vicki. Do they know what venting, I mean, like how much steam does that mean coming out? Does that mean just once you turn on the unit or? Uh, no. So look at the picture in diagram two. It's going to be a steady stream of steam. Lots of steam. You want all of that air to get out of your pressure canner. All right, then you put your um, your weight on the vent port, and then once, well, once you get up to your pressure on the dial gauge, that's when you start your processing time. So each recipe will say 90 minutes, 75 minutes. You start when you hit that pressure. Does that make sense, the pound is pressure? Just to go back to your exhausting, um, yeah. before you turn on any of the heat then, or what is that oh. timeline? Oh, I see. So you, tr yeah, you turn it on, start it cooking. Okay. And then once that, you know, when you boil something and there's steam, right? Okay. It just will come out. Okay. Is that clear as mud? Sorry, no, I, I feel like I'm not. I just wasn't sure. Okay. You just put the jars in and then it had to be vented down. But what is the length of Oh, the I see. What are um, you doing between it's, those two? Yeah, you're just turning up the heat and it's maybe 15 minutes. Okay. Until you start venting, maybe? I don't know. Okay. About that. Um, okay. Then you're going to start your timer once you hit the pounds pressure that you need. If it goes below for longer than, I don't know, five minutes or something, you need to start your timer over. So it's important that you stay here, kind of babysit it till it gets to like the pounds pressure you need and it's and it stays there. You can be above, but just don't go below for too long. And if it's longer than, I would say, five minutes, then you need to start over. Because you have to have that consistent heat for that certain amount of time to kill that botulism toxin. Yeah, I have, that's what I've learned is you can't go do something else. Yeah, and like don't go take a nap. To get to that 1300, you've got to really sit there and fiddle with it. Fiddle with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You cannot do another thing. Yeah. Um, I will say that, uh, just a second, and then I'll get to you. Um, a gas stove is like ideal. I work on an electric stove. <laughs> it's less than ideal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What if it's an, like an outside Yep, stove? you can do a camp chef. Yeah. Lots of people do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So when, when you said fiddle, you're talking about raising the heat. Yeah, and I'm in the, I have an electric stove as well. So you, you yeah. got to get to that 1300. Sometimes you'll do it, and then you'll look in three minutes, and it's more than so you gotta just yeah. Fuss with it. It's a little fiddly. So is it camp chef outside? It's better, right? Because it mimics a gas stove. Because yeah. it is a gas stove, um, so it's a little bit easier. 
Um, I, I would say um, I do pressure can on a glass top stove, but I contacted the manufacturer and asked them about weight limits, heat refraction. Those are two things. You can write that down. You can put it in your phone or whatever. Those are the two things you have to ask your manufacturer is about the weight limit and then the amount of heat that gets refracted back onto your glass top surface. Does that make sense? Who has a glass top? <laughs> it's like most everybody. I tried water bathing on my glass top. I couldn't get it up to temperature, so we had to go buy a camp chef so that we could do it. Oh, really? Um, yeah, my, oh. it would not heat up enough to boil the water to water bath. Typically on those flat huh. stoves, you got to have a complete flat bottom pan. Yeah, so if your fill packers have a ripple in them, yeah. So that would be why that would not heat up. Yeah, that's a really good point, Vicky. And sometimes those ripple bottoms, they will stick to that glass top and then also shatter. So you know, just be mindful. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Heat refraction. So the amount of heat that comes off of the bottom of your canner. Because for, for a Presto, it might not be that big of a deal, but an All-American, like that really thick metal, it will heat up the um, your your glass top, yeah. And I think you say that you're getting to your 13 pound pressure or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's starting to get up about 12, you can kind of start thinking about backing off. Yeah, back off, off just a little bit. Once it's 13, then if you back it off, then it's going to be above, yeah. you'll do a little more play in the fluctuation on it. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what's next. Okay, so once you've got it, your timer is done, turn off your burner and remove from heat. If you're using a gas top, you don't have to like take it off the heat. You can just turn off the heat. But for me, it's a glass top. I kind of gently put it to the other side of the stove. Um, and then when you're removing your, okay. So you remove it. I shouldn't say, then you take your lid. Don't take your lid off. It won't let you. It's locked. Once it goes down to zero, I set a timer for five minutes, an additional five minutes, just to be safe, because I'm neurotic. Um, and then you'll lift off away from your face. Don't do it toward your face. And yeah, and sorry, you'll also want to take this off. But by then, there shouldn't be any pressure in your, in your thing. Remove and then let it sit for another five minutes. Um, and then I take it out and put it on either a wrap or a dish towel. Yeah, and those pictures there, it doesn't look like it has a pressure gauge on it. It doesn't have a dial gauge on it. This one is just a, um, a weighted gauge. Like a water pressure pump, canner. Like, that... No, this is a pressure canner. Uh, there are two types of pressure canners, one that has a dial gauge here at the top, and then the other is just this in the middle. And you regulate that by listening to the rocks back and forth. It's like, I think five to six rocks per minute is what you want to listen for. Okay. So it's a, it's a little harder. Uh, stick to the dial gauge, yeah. if I could give you some advice. <laughs> the dial gauge is way easier. Yeah, yeah, I would say kind of on that one too, if you're out on the yard sales, whatever, if you do see one of those, the weights are usually 5, 10, or 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to get 13 pounds, it's a little more difficult. So I'd probably save your money, like you say, and then do make Just sure do you the get on it for all the safety reasons. Yeah, thank you. Uh, at the very beginning, you said something about something available in September. Yes, it's, a, it's another type of pressure canner called an All-American. And that's the heavier um, pressure canner I was talking about earlier. Yeah, and Vicki can give you information about that, but um, it's, I love that pressure canner. It's like, I don't have to worry, really. I don't worry about this either, but it's just like so heavy duty, super thick metal. It's made in the US, like it is, it's not gonna blow. So what do you mean it's available in September? They don't make them yet? Oh no, it, it's been available since the 60s, but they're just, because of metal shortages or whatever, they're just having a hard time getting oh, them in no. stock. So they'll be here? They yeah, told me that Hopefully. they would send them in October. We're just, that's how far a lead time has been. We're done. carrying all the time, it's just. So did you say you cannot use your glass top with your All-American? No, I use it on my All-American, 
or the All American on my glass top. Yeah. yeah. On my uh, stove top. You'll want to call your manufacturer. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Good. Okay. Let's go. Okay, so when you're processing things in the pressure canner, um, you are going to want to leave more headspace than when you water bath can. Most of your headspace recommendations are going to be one inch, which is the bottom of the threads on your jar. The reason being is at 240 or 250 degrees, the stuff in there is going to be boiling really hard. Even after you take your jars out when you're done processing, they will probably boil for at least, I mean, six, eight, 12 hours. Like it, it's hot in there. I've had, I've done uh, beef chunks before and they just boiled for a long time. You'll be surprised. Can you leave less, I mean more than that space or do you want to be exact? Um, you'll want to be exact. That headspace is really important because you'll want the least amount of air in there, but also not too much for the bottle of toxin. Yes. Are all the in the in the menu in the ball book like these pictures? Um, I don't. These ones I believe are just through the Utah State Extension website. So you can go to that website or. Um, Let's just take a look. I'm pretty sure these are in the book. I could be totally wrong. Yeah, so in here are, is information about your pressure canner, that information that you'll want. Okay. All right, this is just talking about uh, processing. We've already would it matter if you had an inch and a quarter all the time? I, I mean, if what some do you of the new products use an inch and a quarter. What if you, oh, sure, sure. It doesn't. Um, so I use an inch and a quarter sometimes for, well, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, I mean, would it matter of that little quarter inch at all? Um, yeah. No, a quarter inch wouldn't matter. Another inch, yes, that okay. would matter. So try to keep it between an inch and an inch. So your salmon had quite a bit of empty space in yeah. there. How did that happen? Okay, that's a great question. So this is a raw pack, which means I didn't cook the salmon before I packed it in the jars. So as salmon cooks, it shrinks, and then also the liquid, the omegas, will come out of it. So that's why there's liquid in there, but it's also smaller. So, so it's its own juice is what's in yeah. The only thing I added to that salmon was salt. Yeah. So sometimes uh, you would do other meats like this, like chicken, you might not cook ahead of time. You just raw pack it and you want to do it kind of quickly. You'd pack your jars and it would end up shrinking a bit and then it, it looks almost exactly like that. Yes. I love questions. Don't be like, oh, I'm asking another question. I love it. Oh, years. Yeah. Um, with canning, as long as it's sealed, it's good. What happens is that it just deteriorates over time. So, you know, it's like when you freeze meat, right? Like it's really, really great for about a year and then it just starts not being like the very best after a year or two. But yeah, I have um, salmon in my pantry from two years ago and it's Good question. Uh, can I add that just for info? Um, yeah. I was at a prepper's class recently okay. and um, a cooking class, and she uh, had beef, roast beef. And yeah. She brought out to make tacos for us, and it was eight years old. Awesome. Yeah. So it was. And was it good? So good. Yeah. 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 As long as it's sealed, good. And done properly, I guess I should. <laughs> You're like, I water bathed it for 10 hours and it's sealed. It's fine. <laughs> no. Pressure can. Okay. Um, we've already talked about this venting the canner. Um, yeah. Put your jars in, lid on, turn up the heat. Like she was asking how long, about 10 or 15 minutes till you start that timer. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. 
Okay, um, this is the important part that we were talking about, the loss or fluctuations in your pressure. You'll want to keep it at where you need to be. It can be a little bit above. Try not to go below for too long. Um, what can happen is you can have food spoilage, foodborne illness, loss of liquid in your jars. How many of you, when you're pressure canning, sometimes there's some siphoning that comes out? That happens with temperature fluctuations. That can be when it's on the stove top, or sometimes when you take the jar off and you don't let it rest in there for five minutes, and you take it out and it just starts oozing. Anybody ever had that? Don't be scared. I say oozing, but it's really just like, sometimes a little bit will come out. That's called siphoning. Totally normal sometimes with temperature fluctuations. Would it reseal though, or is it? Yeah. Well, it depends. You need to check your seals after 24 hours, see how they are. Um, you can reprocess things in your pressure canner. You wipe the lid, put a new lid on, and then process again if you want, or just eat whatever it is. And the obvious way to tell if it didn't seal right is the lid wouldn't be... Concave, right. Okay. Like that woman in the video said, she just pushed it down with her finger. I was like, oh, don't do that. If it's not sealed, eat it right away or reprocess with a new lid. Sound good? Okay, like we said, uh, when the lid is open, tilt it away from you. There will be a lot of steam, a lot of heat. Don't get that near your face. Okay. Yep, just cooling it off. Um, oh, okay, so this is something that I just saw recently on Instagram. <laughs> you see a lot of crazy things online, honestly. Like, someone had taken... Okay, so say that this is full of your jars. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They put it near their like sink, it's on cold, and they're just doing this on the edge of their canner to cool it off and to bring this down to zero faster. I was like, what is she doing? Um, there's a whole hashtag uh, on social media called Rebel Canning, and that's basically where they just encourage you to do like all the stuff like super not safe things um, in canning. And I did go down a little bit of a rabbit hole and I was like, no, no, because you can't unsee it. Um, on Instagram, my Instagram handle is smart home canning. So if you want to follow me, I teach, you know, online as well. Um, but I, I just want to kind of counter all that rebel canning that's going on online. You know, some of those things that people are doing that are just so unsafe. Um, and I would say even in this picture, I wouldn't put my finished jars that just came out of my canner on my stovetop like that. I would want them on a rack or someplace where they aren't coming in contact with something that's cold. Because if you have a stone countertop and you put a super hot glass jar, you can possibly break your jars and ruin all that hard work. Okay. Um, and then when you go to store your canner, you're going to want to clean it out really good, dry it out. One thing that I do on my Presto um, is I will unscrew, or is it this part? I think it's this part. You can unscrew, and sometimes I'll clean that out. If I've done something like like uh, I did roast beef and it was just really kind of like oily or something, you know, like under here and on here. So I did clean that out with soap and water. You don't want water to get on your dial gauge. So just be mindful of that. I'm trying to think of what else I do. I did have something happen this year, which was really interesting, which is when I started my water bath can, or sorry, my pressure canner, there was like this really high pitched sound and I called All American right away and they said, oh yeah, we know what that is. All you have to do is clean out your vent port with a little toothpick or whatever. And I was like, what? Did it? Fine. So there are 1-800 um, numbers that they can answer your questions as well if you're not in the store or can't find the answer online. Do you take the sealing ring out too and clean that? 
Yes, I'll take the sealy ring out and then also if I need to that uh, that little pop up thing. Any other questions? Okay. Make sure everything is super dry. I actually store my lid like this so that it's not on all the way that air can flow in there because sometimes if you miss like a little bit of water or something, it can just get kind of musty. Not from personal experience. It is from personal experience. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's talk about this. This is super important with any type of canning and that is to use like the best produce. Don't use things that are like just right on the edge, just starting to go, I know, no. Rebel canning, okay, I, w I went down a rabbit hole. So make sure you're using fresh, ripe, and firm vegetables that are free of disease and bruises because if you process something in your jars that has mold or something, it's gonna ruin your whole jar. Your whole batch will get ruined. Um, sort vegetables by size and ripeness. Thoroughly wash everything. This is super important because uh, botulism actually occurs naturally in your dirt. So if you don't wash everything properly, like your tomatoes or potatoes, whatever you're doing, um, that botulism can be introduced into your uh, jars. Did you guys know that? Botulism is in your dirt? Yeah, science. Okay. Uh, soups and veggie mixtures. This is uh, just what I did in this jar. Um, I chose which vegetables I wanted to do in there. And then you fill it half full of veggies and then the rest you cover with either stock. You can do tomato juice. Um, you could do water, but I think it's more flavorful if you do a stock or a tomato juice with herbs and spices. Yeah. Is there any grain that you can put in your soup that wouldn't turn to mush? I know, I know rice would go picky and noodles or no, but like barley, have you ever? Um, it's not recommended to do grains in pressure canning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's talk about things that aren't recommended, right, in canning in general. Dairy, no. If you wanted to do like a condensed soup, that's not recommended. Um, no flowers, no other grains, like, uh, tell me your name. Susan. Susan said no rice, no noodles. Those aren't recommended um, for home canners. Okay. I have a question. Can you mix what you put in there? Can I do a thing of meat, a thing of beans, or does it all have to, is it best yeah. practice? Yeah, you can mix as long as they have the same processing time. Um, or. Sometimes like if I'm, if I'm processing something that's 75 minutes, another one that's like 90, I don't really care sometimes and I'll just do the 90. Always go with the higher, never go with the lower. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so I've done like salmon and chicken in the same one. If I'm like, I don't wanna waste all this space in my canner, I'll just do some of that. Oh, that's another question. I think somebody here answered me earlier, which is double checking. Um, I can put four jars in something that will date, right? I don't have to fill it full. Yeah, I can do what I have. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So if you're making a vegetable soup, yeah. whatever vegetable is the highest time, that's what you would process. Uh, no, there is uh, in here, it says for soup, you can make your own soup and then it gives a processing time. So it's not like, <clears throat> excuse me, like 90 minutes for potatoes. Or, I don't think that's it, but. Um, you just do the soup processing time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, okay, this is, let's talk about pressure canning meat. How many of you would like to pressure can meat? It's awesome. Imagine your favorite roast in a little jar that's already made and all you have to do is open it up for dinner. It's amazing. Um, so, Let's talk about it. Beef is one of the easiest ground beef. You do have to cook it. And then uh, I like to let it cool. Sometimes I'll put it in the fridge and there will be that fat on the top. You'll need to take that off. If there's too much fat in your canning jars, it can inhibit 
that jar from sealing. It will boil and then get underneath your lid. And it's just so viscous that it stops that lid from sealing. So it's super important that you, if possible, can like par cook your chicken or your ground beef or whatever, and then remove that fat if there's a lot. Sausage, a lot of people do sausage. You can make your own patties, cook them, take that fat off, and then put like three in a jar and then put maybe beef stock or something on the top. Teresa does that. She was like, I take it camping, it's great. <coughs> I know. Does it stay in a patty? Yeah. It stays in like your patty shape. But you pre-cook it all the way through? Or? Mostly cook it through and then you put it on like your, your cast iron skillet if you want. Or you can, well actually it will, it will cook in your pressure canning process. Right? So 90 minutes in here, pressure can your sausage. But I like to pre-cook a little, like mostly. Pre-cook, then can it. Then can, then, then pressure can it. Would and then all you have to do is heat it up when you're camping. Would that be wise for all of those the game meats like deer meat and stuff like that to, to cook it a little bit? Or? Yeah. Well, there's two options. You can do a raw pack like I did with the salmon where you don't cook it at all and you just cut it into chunks, pack it, pressure can it. Or you can, uh, what's called hot pack, where you cook it about like 50 to 75% done, pack it, and then put your broth in if you want. That's a good question. I know, it's exciting once you start thinking all these things you can pressure can. Yes. Question on your last bullet, I hope I'm not getting ahead of you. So no, that's I'm saying fine. soak your beans first, but it's not saying cook them first. Are you just canning them uncooked? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which, the reason you want to do that is because beans expand, right, when you soak them. Yeah. Um, and if you don't soak them, what can happen is they can expand and then ruin your seal, right? Because they will, they'll just be too big for your jar. You put them in like this and they end up like, you know. Yeah, but no cooking. You don't have to. In some of the recipes, like with this white bean, you'll do like 30 minutes on the stove top after you've soaked them. Um, but I've done chili before where I've soaked and then added everything in. And that recipe is in here. Chili con carne is amazing. And one of my favorite things I do is ham and bean soup. After, oh, after oh, I get yeah. that Christmas ham, yeah. it's just so good. And you just like yes. that and your dinner's ready. Yeah. Oh, no. It's delicious. Yeah. Perfect. So do you put the ham in with your beans and pressure can it? I do. Perfect. Yum. Yeah. Yep, so this is a raw pack. You can see it's not cooked at all. You just want to try and pack as much in there as you can. One of the reasons that I do love a hot pack though is that you can pack more in the jars than in a raw pack. Well, no, I said, um, Chris, go back to that. Yeah, his no liquid is added. Does it create its own uh -huh. moisture? Like that's how it? That yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's how the salmon is. Okay. Um, yeah. Most animal meat will have some type of fat or sometimes water, and that will come out in the cooking process. I had a question on the one before. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, it said most seafood except smoked fish. Yeah. So what is that saying? I don't, it's it's just. Or? Yeah. Yeah, so some people will smoke their fish and then want to can it, and that's not recommended. So smoke the one that's the smoke that kind of disrupts things in the canning yeah. process. Yeah, I don't know why, it's just a rule. Okay, all right. Thanks. I don't know everything, I'm sorry. But. Okay. So this is pre-cooking the meat. Um, these guys are doing it on a stove top, but if I'm doing a lot, I will actually do it on a sheet pan in like under the broiler because it's really fast. But that's just me. Live your best life. All right, so you can see the two differences between the raw pack and the hot pack, right? These, uh, the hot pack, the uh, cubes stay about the same size, shape. In the raw pack, it all kind of like congeals a little bit into like a clump. When you do the raw pack, do you add any kind of seasonings with it, or just the? Um, for the salmon, I don't. Although the next time I do it, I do want to add like a couple slices of jalapeno because I think it would give it like some nice flavor. 
Um, just know that when you do add um, seasonings, it does kind of like, um, how do I explain this? You, you put in a little and you get a lot of flavor. So just maybe like dial it in first. Yes, it gets ultra concentrated. Um, so just keep that in mind. Here's some hot pack chicken. You can see it stays in like the nice cubes. That's one of the reasons maybe you would consider doing a hot pack. Okay, which of the following cannot be safely canned in your home pressure canner? What do you guys think? Water. The soup would be awful. I mean, the noodles would just- <laughs> The noodles would, would totally much. disintegrate, wouldn't they? It's actually none of these are recommended for your pressure canning. Wait, uh, mm, I, should, I shouldn't say never. I don't believe crab meat can, but I could be, I could, let me look that up after class. But I don't believe any of these are recommended. The chicken noodle soup has noodles that are not recommended. Pumpkin puree, they found that they couldn't like penetrate that heat all the way to the center of the pumpkin puree for some reason. It's just too thick. So they don't recommend pressure canning that. They recommend that you do it in chunks. Mm -hmm. Chunks are okay. Spinach, not recommended. Green peanuts, crab meat. I'm gonna have to look that up. I thought most seafood was okay. Butter, definitely not. That's a rebel canning technique. I will tell you, I saw some crazy butter <laughs> recipes for canning. Okay. All right, th these are the steps to preventing botulism. Um, number one, use a pressure canner, not a water bath canner. Food must be properly prepared and processed for the correct amount of times, like we said. Um, canner must be accurate. You'll want to check your dial gauge. And you'll want to follow your recipe exactly. Don't add extra sugar and definitely don't add extra fat. Probably saying freeze, not. Okay, perfect. Um, don't add thickeners. Uh, use recommended canners and don't rush the time for cool down. Don't get crazy. Don't put it under water. Okay. Uh, there's also a fact sheet on the website down here. You can take a picture of that or just look it up right now. Um, Extension.usu.edu backslash preserve the harvest. All right, so this is the, what is it? Six steps to, so let's review. Put in your jars, put your lid on. Oh. Chris, what are you doing? I didn't to me? do it. <laughs> you did it. Okay. Then you're going to want to take your weighted gauge off. Start the water boiling and exhausting. Steam is really coming out. Not just a little bit, like a lot. You want a lot of steam to come out and exhaust that canner for 10 minutes. Um, then you're going to want to close um, or add your tetcock, your weighted gauge. And then start counting your process time when you're up to your correct pressure. Adjust pressure for altitude if needed. Turn off heat at end of processing. Once you're done, let the pressure drop down to zero. I wait an additional five minutes. You don't have to, but I like to just assess what I like. Then I take the weighted gauge off, take the lid off, and then Remove your jars. Make sure that they are not on like a super cold countertop. Make sure you put them on a rack or a dish towel. Let them cool for 24 hours. Check your seals and then go from there. You can also see on my jars, I don't have any rings on my jars. Um, after I clean off my jars, once they're done processing, I dry them, store them without the rings. That way I can see if there's um, a seal that um, I have a question on hasn't my sealed plan. right and away. It's just an exhaust canner, 10 minutes. Yeah. Now, does that mean you're heating it up and you're watching the... Yeah, and there's steam coming right out of here for 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Uh huh. Okay, then you put 
your gate, yeah. gate vent on? Yeah. Okay. And then this pressure will start building. If you're venting, this should be at zero. Okay. It shouldn't be higher. Then once you put your your gauge on, is that mm -hmm. when you put your little weight on? Yep. <coughs> right here. Uh -huh. Then you're going to add that on, and then you're going to watch this go up and up till you're about 13 pounds pressure. Okay. And right before it gets to 13, like Vicky said, maybe back off just a little bit. Yeah, there's some steps to follow, but once you get in the groove of it and you're like comfortable doing it, it'll feel really great. Right. Is that it? No, there's more. Okay. Okay, salt is for flavor only. A lot of people think salt as a preservative, but really in pressure canning, it's going to be the heat, the temp, and the time, uh, not the salt that's doing the preserving. Spices may, and herbs may be added in small quantities, right? You don't want to like overly flavor something. Uh, do not add butter or fats unless specifically allowed in your tested recipe. No grains or pasta. Use hard water. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I'll have to look that up later. Okay, mixing veggies should have similar processing time. Any questions? Question. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about prepping your jars? Oh, sure. Uh, that's a great question. So if you're reusing your jars, not like these, um, you're going to want to run them through like your dishwasher cycle. You want to wash them in hot, soapy water. For, for um, pressure canning, they don't have to be sterilized, but you want them to be clean. Hot, soapy water. Make sure everything's like washed and good before you put it in. So the dishwasher would sterilize them? Sure. Or is that a two-step wash them, then dishwasher? Or wash them? No, so I would just do other. one or the other. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, great question. Um, it said there are, for soups, when you mix um, spices in it, um, my mother-in-law, <laughs> bless her heart, she uh -oh. did um, tomato soup, uh -huh. and once we pureed the tomatoes, she put it in a thing and heat it up and add the spices to it, and it would be warm when she put it into the mason jars. Yeah. Put the seed on it, then she'd do, I'm not sure if it was a, a, a pressure or just the- um, Water bath. Water bath to do that, but is that okay to do? I mean, it, it was, well, not for this, the best tomato soup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are really great recipes. You'll wanna, when you're first starting and I recommend just doing tested recipes always. Um, but like with that make your own soup kind of thing, you can add herbs and spices and it doesn't change the pH. Okay. Um, yeah, she's got it all written. Uh, I've been doing it for years. I'm like. <laughs> yeah, and if you have questions about a recipe, you can always send it into the extension office, the USU extension office, and just say, hey, I want to either water bath or pressure can this. Does this look okay? and they, they will have um, experts available for that. That's a great question. And that's for water bath canning as well. If you have questions, you can always um, call them or email them with your recipe and just There's ask. a national canning website where they have a bunch of tested yep. recipes and awesome. Yeah, Ooh. it's called the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Is that on your chain? No, um, and they also have available, um, I believe it's called the Complete Guide to Home Canning, available online, it's an e-book. Yeah. yeah, so what did National, what was that? Center for Home Food Preservation. Thanks. Yeah. Well, now I have probably a, a dumb question. No dumb question. The difference between pressure cooking and water bath, does it depend on what you're, what a can? Yes. Does. This is low acid foods are what you want to do in your pressure canner. Remember, because we're doing a higher temperature to kill that botulism toxin in low acid now foods. Is there something in that book that tells you you're <clears throat> low acid? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And each recipe will tell you whether it's a pressure canned recipe or a water bath. Oh, um, okay, good. That yeah. Yeah. You don't have to guess. You're like, <laughs> is okra? I don't know. Yeah. So last season when you couldn't find any lids. Yes. I bought here the lips that were PUR, 
Yeah. Are they okay for pressure canning? Anyone's I've used them for pressure canning. Um, the fail rate is a little bit higher on the PUR lids, um, but we have other lids now, right? Yeah, Teresa covered They're that good. last week. She does serve through the classes that teaches everyone there. Yeah. And she said the it's 99% time the consumers felt that the fail rate is because of the consumer rather than yeah. in the lid. Didn't, yeah, they didn't take the lid straight or the bottle out. It may have. They do have a tendency to sprinkle a little more, but that's still tightening because I think they're a little thinner, but I think everything's getting thinner with what's being made. Yeah. But, uh, Teresa covered that in our last class, and they work, they do well. You can use them in a pressure situation. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If it's a pressure canner lid, um, you, you should be good. Um, one problem that I did run into with those lids, it's almost like they were compacted, and I did contact the company, and they sent me a replacement box. Um, like the, the edges were just very compacted. I sent him a picture and I was like, is this right? Because they weren't really fitting on my jar as well. And they were like, oh no, that's a manufacturer defect. So if you do have problems with your lid, contact them. They're really, really good customer service. And are you aware of any um, hands-on classes? I'm still not trusting myself or my kitchen <laughs> to not end up like that. Um, yes, so there is a Master Food Preservers course um, available. There's also online resources, but if you're looking for a hands-on experience, I actually am like I'm doing my own um, weekend retreat for food preserving in September. It's September 8th through the 11th, um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun for me. I love food preserving. Um, I've rented an Airbnb up in Eden, and uh, you can find that information on my website, smarthomecanning.com. What what time is it even? I don't even know. Thank you so much. Okay, yes. Okay, great. Vicky's gonna do a giveaway. Okay, Mandy's gonna walk around. Who didn't get an opportunity to write your name on this paper? She's going to fill up this box. We're gonna give a lottery away. And uh, just real quick, we wanna thank Anna. It's all the time, all of the prep that goes into uh, the handout. Everyone does have a handout, which we just got out. It will show every slide that she went over, so if we need to refer back to something there.